What exactly is symmetry? The experience many of us have in school is that mathematics is only about numbers. But here, I want to give you a glimpse into a beautiful mathematical subject that places numbers on the back burner and instead takes symmetries and patterns as its main objects of study. This subject is known by mathematicians as group theory and has applications in areas as wide ranging as particle physics, crystallography, and chemistry. So not only is group theory a beautiful subject, it is also incredibly useful. As the name suggests, group theory is a subject which centers around a precise mathematical object known as a group. Intuitively, a group is any symmetry of an object. So pick a specific object, say a checkerboard, and rotate it by 90 degrees. After this action, the board looks almost exactly the same, except now the color of the corners have flipped. So we have not preserved the original structure. Now go back to the original position and rotate it by 180 degrees instead. This time, the board looks exactly the same, so we can say that a 180 degree rotation is a symmetry of the checkerboard. Are there any other symmetries? The only other symmetry is if you rotate it by 360 degrees, but this is exactly the same as if you did nothing. Of course, you can also rotate by any integer multiple of 180 degrees, but any of these rotations will always just be equivalent to either doing nothing or to rotating by 180. So the checkerboard has only two symmetries. And believe it or not, this small collection is already a group. Now how would the symmetries change if we made all the squares the same color? In this case, the board looks exactly the same whenever we rotate by 90 degrees or any multiple of it. So we can rotate the square by 180, 270, and 360 degrees, which again is equivalent to doing nothing. So the symmetries of the board can now be expressed as multiples of these four rotations. And if the bottom of the board was also the same color, in addition to these rotations, we can also do a reflection across the x-axis, a reflection across the y-axis, and a reflection across each of the diagonals while also preserving the original structure. So collecting these actions together, we get a group that mathematicians call D4, or the symmetry group of the square, where each of these actions is just one element in the group. Now before giving the abstract definition of a group, let's consider the symmetries of one more object. This time we'll consider a coin. In this case, the angle of rotation does not matter. So there are an infinite number of rotations you can perform that all preserve the original structure of the coin. Similarly, there are an infinite number of lines that you can reflect across that are all symmetries. And the collection of all these rotations and reflections form the group of symmetries of the coin, or more generally, of any circle, in this case producing an infinite set. Mathematicians have a fancy name for this group too. It's called the orthogonal group of dimension 2, or O2 for short. Going up to 3D and considering a cylinder or a torus, we find additional symmetries, with the symmetry group of a ball or a sphere having yet more. Now if we closely analyze the behavior of all of the symmetric actions we just performed, a few patterns emerge. First, the list of actions you can perform is fixed. No matter in what order you perform an action or how many times you do it, this will always be equivalent to one of the actions already in the list. Second, any sequence of actions you perform is associative, so it doesn't matter which order you do them, the result is the same. Next, any action you perform can be undone by another action. That is, after doing one action, you can always get back to the original position by doing some other action in the list. And lastly, not doing anything is also considered an action. These then are the basic ingredients of what mathematicians call a group. And the definition of a group simply encodes these ingredients into a precise mathematical form. The formal definition says that a group G is a set together with a binary operation that satisfies the following three criteria. For any three elements in the group, the binary operation is associative. An identity element exists and for every element in the group, there exists an inverse element. If only condition one is satisfied, we have something called a semi-group. 
And if condition one and two are both satisfied, then we have something called a monoid. Each of these structures are interesting in their own right, but the structure that fully captures the notion of symmetries is that of a group. And if, in addition to these three, the group also satisfies one more condition, we say that the group is abelian or commutative. I'd like you now to just sit back and try to appreciate what has just been done. Our vague, intuitive notion of symmetry has been placed on rigorous mathematical ground. By carefully examining the symmetries of a physical object, something which we all seem to have a fairly good intuitive understanding of, mathematicians have been able to isolate what is common to all of these situations and form a precise, abstract mathematical structure out of it. And although this object is unlike any of the concrete, physical objects we began with, in the sense that it is not a thing that can be felt, touched, or seen, it is nevertheless something very real. And for any abstract group of symmetries, each element will always have a concrete meaning that is intimately tied to it being a particular transformation that preserves some concrete structure. Whether it's the structure of a cube, a snowflake, or even a fundamental particles. Now to give you a taste for just how powerful and far-reaching group theory is, I'd like to end this video by giving a very brief one-minute lesson on one of the most profound ideas that links group theory to physics and that is Noether's theorem. This theorem was formulated by the German mathematician Emmy Noether around 100 years ago. It states that for any continuous symmetry that you can find in a theory, there will always be a corresponding conserved quantity. For example, you may have learned about the conservation of momentum or energy. These correspond to the fact that isolated systems will be symmetric under spatial translations and time translations, which means the laws of physics won't change if you move your experiment somewhere else in space or to another moment in time. Another conserved quantity you might have encountered is angular momentum, which occurs in systems that are symmetric under rotational invariance, like the gravitational field of a star or black hole. Admittedly, these are just a few simple examples, but this line of thinking permeates almost all of modern theoretical physics. Whether the objects of study are fundamental particles, or the Lagrangian of a quantum field theory or string theory, one of the first line of questions a theoretical physicist pursues is to ask, what are the symmetries of my theory? This question then naturally leads to the discovery of some sort of group that encodes all of the symmetries, and consequently, some conserved quantity. Arguably, a theoretical physicist has no other task than that of discovering these symmetries.